Uh, well, let's move on to the software-based uh, vendors, uh, software-based infrastructure with offerings. Uh, so let's start with video. Obviously, they made a, a huge um, uh, Big leap in, in, in this year. Uh, in June 2010, they partnered with HP. Um, and to kind of, you know, what do you think about that? Is this, is this good? Is this bad? I think it's brilliant. I think, uh, you know, I really like video. I think they're a great little a scrappy company, very similar to Brightcom. Uh, you know, when you look at the market today, there's kind of two segments. There's the firmware guys, which is Polycom, LifeSize, Cisco, that uh, build firmware products that they can basically encode and decode a single stream of video. Uh, you know, and I kind of equate those to the old flip phone kind of firmware-based cell phones we used to all have. Uh, and then there's the new kind of, you know, technology, which is the processor-based or, or, you know, computer-based type uh, distribution. And that's video, Skype, Brightcom, and RadVision. And kind of putting us in two camps that way really helps you to see the difference between the two companies. I think that Video looked at that and thought, you know, here's our chance to do something different. Right. And they went down to the H.264 SVC capability, which gives them the ability to stream at a lower bit, bit rate. Uh, that's pretty cool technology. I'm, I'm a little jealous of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it. It works great for a consumer style manufacturer like HP, where now you can be confident that your, your video is going to look good. At the high end of the marketplace, it doesn't play that well. Uh, that's the challenge. Is it, it doesn't integrate with the traditional MCU technology. Uh, it is H.264 SVC, not ABC. Uh, and I think they've really leveraged that codec. And you begin to wonder, is video the codec or is it the products they make? If it's just the codec, codecs come and go. Uh, so hopefully they'll be able to have a good run while that codec is, is valuable. I do think it's interesting with them that no one has bought them yet. But they've signed some very large OEM deals with Cisco and with right. with HP, uh, and then a new one last week with a, a, a laptop manufacturer. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So I think that'll be interesting to see, you know, where they go in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, if a new codec comes along that's superior to H.264 SVC, like maybe VP8 from Google or some of the things we're hearing, uh, that might put them in a difficult spot. But today they're in a great spot in the industry. It certainly looks like it. Uh, let's move on to Rad Vision. Uh, looks like about in spring of this year they had a deal with Avaya. What did that do for them, and what did uh, for the industry as well? I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's a uh, Rad Vision. You know, used to have a, a great deal with Cisco, and then kind of Cisco acquiring Tanberg made them a little redundant. They're still there. They're still selling it, but it's a uh, it's not what it used to be. It's not the uh, shining star of their OEM deals. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be interesting to see what Rad Vision does. I have to give Rad Vision, you know, two stars for really coming back into the industry, not giving up, being, getting very aggressive. Uh, they have great installed base of customers. They have been acquiring new customers. Uh, but when I compare them to things like Video or Brightcom or Skype, mm -hmm. uh, which you know are their competitors, they may not put them in that perspective yet, but they really are the ones they're competing against. They only really do you know, the distribution of video, they do multi-way, uh, they don't have SVC like, like, vid like Video does, they don't have integrated data like Brightcom does and audio, they don't have some of the things that other players have. What they do have is a product that's been around for a long time, very well thought through mm -hmm. and very stable. So. Uh, I think they'll do well for the foreseeable future. I think they need to innovate and uh, do things more like some of the other players in their space. Uh, we see Skype, you know, obviously adding data and doing things to be more Brightcom-like. Right. Uh, and I think that's that's an interesting play that they'll have to, in the next couple of years, you know, go after those new market spaces or kind of be stuck in a rut. Sure. Well, let's uh, continue to talk about Skype. Um, obviously, they were spun off from eBay in uh, early this year. Uh, Clearly, with 8 million users for video and over 450 million for voice, I mean, just hugely popular with grandmas and yeah, <laughs> alike. Everybody, and their brother. <laughs> everybody is, is using it. Um, what do you think? I mean, where are they going? How is this going to play out? What, what, how are people looking at them? Like you said, for Pride Vision, how are people yeah. looking at them? Too? Well, Skype has the ultimate benefit that they're free. You know, that's their, their big benefit. You know, it's as long as Skype is free, I think they'll have a great install base. Mm -hmm. If they start charging and charging for extra features and becoming not free, I think that'll make life more, much more challenging for them. Uh, obviously, this last week they've had a, a significant outage, we'll just put it in that space, uh, for an extended period of time. That's one of the challenges with being a public network provider. You know, they don't sell a product per se, they are a public network provider. Uh, that's a very different market than the market that, that the rest of us are in. Um, video and, and Rad Vision and Redcom, we don't have our own network. We partner with network, network providers. Uh, Skype is the network. I think one thing that would be interesting in the future is if Skype was to open up more. You know, we were uh, played around with the SIP for Skype technology a little while ago, uh, and they really didn't go forward with that. They really didn't open that up. 
I think that would be probably my advice to Skype is open up, let Brightcom play with you, let video play with you, let other people play with you, uh, let us interconnect our endpoints and infrastructures into your public networks uh, and then see if we can cross those things together. I think that would be an interesting play for them. Today, uh, they don't seem too interested in that, but we'll see what happens in the, in the next year or so. That's true. Um, well, that leads us, uh, leaves us with Brightcom. Uh, we talk a little bit about us, but not too much. Um, April 2010, we came out with our new media framework, the uh, VCS 2.6 release. Mm -hmm. um, it has a lot more foundation for it, a brand new foundation for a media type play. We added on a whole bunch of capabilities. What was, you know, what is it, what is it going to lead to? What was the main points of this BMF sort of foundation? Yeah, the Brightcom Media Framework. Yes. It's a mouthful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think when we looked at what was going on with video in general, video was, was pretty much just video. It, it didn't really do anything but video. So if you want to show PowerPoint, you know, you took the PowerPoint, converted it to video. That's not what you would do on a computer, and that's not what a processor-based system should do. We found that all the media frameworks that were out there, so things like QuickTime, Microsoft Silverlight, they were not made for live conferencing. They really didn't lend themselves to that. Uh, so we, we felt the need uh, several years ago to build our own. What that means is that over the next few years, we'll be able to do things with an integration of voice, audio, and video that are significantly different. So today, when you see video, you're seeing video like you know, the raw, the way it comes out of a camera. Contrast that to what you see in films, where you've got overlay technology, you have the integration of multiple different video assets, you might have data or animation overlaid on top of videos. Things like that have a huge place in video conferencing and is not really done today. Uh, the next few years, I think we'll see an explosion, and hopefully with Brightcom leading the technology piece of that, uh, into integrating into the video stream and making that video stream much more valuable than it is today. Uh, we're seeing you know, video games that are more advanced and complex than state-of-the-art video conferencing. That's an odd position. We really should be quite the other way where you know, the video conferencing industry is leading the video side of the industry. Right. Yeah. Um, and how, as our partnership in about May, we kind of uh, announced a partnership with Sprint 4G. Mm -hmm. How does that add on to the, um, our infrastructure? And well, 4G is huge. You know, I think 4G is a game changer for mobile video conferencing. I think tying into a telepresence system or a conference room system with people in the field that have a handheld device that can capture high definition data, bring it in, uh, and you can broadcast to them is a game changer. I think that's a great tool for business. I think it's obviously huge for personal interaction. Uh, I can see that in the next few years we'll start to see you know, more and more and more video usage where it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. And I think that a handheld device is, is very intimate and very personal, and it's a good place to, to use that extended video uh, engagement. In business, you know, being able to have a mobile device that I can point at a production line or a, a damaged vehicle for an insurance claim or anything like that, uh, it's just a super little tool to have. Right. And I think we'll see a lot, of, a lot of use in that space. Interesting. Yeah. So um, kind of last but not least, we uh, announced a new desktop HD camera with onboarding, or H.264 onboarding. Um, how does that play into our conference room strategy? How does that connect with Lee? How, you know, how, how are we approaching that? Sure. So normal, uh, normal, hmm, normal <laughs> standard desktop cameras, they do all the encoding of the video using the computer processor. So as you go up to HD or higher resolutions, it can really drag down your processor and takes up all your RAM. and that if you want to do a spreadsheet or share anything, you don't have enough power left. So what we do is we put a chip actually in the camera that takes care of all that processing, so it offloads the processor. That's actually what a video conferencing encoder decoder does. It takes all that processing and does it in the encoder. So putting that in a little desktop camera means the camera can be, have tremendous resolution and not burden the PC. That means you can do data sharing, a lot of other cool things. I think there will come a day, though, in the next you know, three or four years, where everyone will switch to processor-based video processing like Brightcom already does, where we won't need to use that chip. So in our codex, we use processor-based video processing. Right. In the camera that we sell for plugging into a USB port, we use the chip-based processing, and that's to offload your laptop. So different ways to do it for different environments.